have your Bible here this morning, and I hope that you're prepared to read the Scriptures and hear what God would speak to us by the Holy Spirit through the inspired, inerrant, infallible Word of God. And we're going to look at Revelation chapter 3 this morning, starting a reading at verse 7. So I'm going to give you a moment to open there. We've been really enjoying a a series here in, in our church over the last, well, this is the sixth letter now. When we commenced worshipping here in this building, we're only brand new here. If you've come along in the last six weeks and you think this is kind of status quo for us, we're still trying to find our way here. This is all pretty brand new. But on the first Sunday here, we commenced a series looking at the, the idea of what a church should look like. And, and when we asked the question what a church should look like, our goal wasn't to go to Christians and poll them or some kind of, some kind of systemic survey. Our goal wasn't to ask around or read all the latest, greatest books on church life and ministry. But we decided that the best place, the safest place, the most God-honoring place to go would be Scripture. So we thought that we would spend seven Sundays, seven Sunday mornings, looking every Sunday at one of the letters to the churches in the book of Revelation, uh, penned by John, given by Jesus Christ to those churches in Asia Minor that predominantly were planted and pioneered probably by Paul the Apostle. So this morning's letter, we're looking at the church in Philadelphia. Philadelphia is a, is a compound word from two Greek words, meaning love, phileo, or, or, and, and the second word is delphoi, which is brother. So Philadelphia just essentially means brotherly love, the church of brotherly love in the city of brotherly love. We're going to have a look now at the letter that Jesus had written to this church in Philadelphia. We're going to take some time this morning to look at what this letter says. Verse 7, Jesus speaking, And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, The words of the Holy One, the True One, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one opens. I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door which no one is able to shut. I know that you have been little, I know that you have but little power, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not, but lie. Behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you. Because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. I am coming soon. Hold fast what you have so that no one may seize your crown. The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it, and I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven and my own new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Let's take a look, as is our custom each time we, we delve into one of these letters, let's briefly just look at the city wherein this church is planted. The church in Philadelphia is a small church. You wouldn't call it necessarily a thriving church, but it would be appropriate to call it a steadfast church. It is a church that Jesus himself says has remained faithful. It's, it's held the faith and it's maintained its confession that Jesus is Lord and Christ and by His atonement, by His death and burial, and by His resurrection, we obtain peace with God and forgiveness of sins. But in this church, a lot like we saw in the church in Smyrna, there is a grievous challenge. There is a, there's a major group that is persecuting the church inside the city, and that is a group of Jewish people. We talked about this before. We talked about how at various times during the the Roman Empire and at various times during the, the rule and the sway of this, the greatest empire the world had ever known as it made its unhindered march across to all corners of the known world, people within the empire were so permitted and free to travel and move about quite without molestation and quite freely. And the Jewish people were not exempt from observing the opportunity economically and in business to move to other cities engage in trade and make a great life for themselves. By the time we arrive at the first century, 
we no longer think of the Jewish people, the Israelites that we've been so acidically, uh, not acidically, assiduously studying each Sunday night. We no longer think of them as a group of people confined within some national border. But the Jewish people in the first century had essentially sprayed out to all corners of the Roman Empire in an attempt to make a, a great life for themselves, build synagogues, even missionary labor was conducted and they saw themselves as very much Roman citizens with the right to travel and engage in business with Gentiles. And so we see in Smyrna and now we see it here in Philadelphia, there is a thriving, profoundly uh, attended synagogue right there in the city of Philadelphia. The city of Philadelphia is quite a strong city, it's quite a popular city, it's quite an economically uh, proud city, but the reality is it lives a little too close to a volcano. So what that means is that at several times during the, the progress of the city at varying decades and centuries, the volcano erupts, essentially wipes the city out, and people slowly meander back to rebuild their lives and predominantly rebuild their, 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 their agriculture because Philadelphia was a place that grew vines and grapes for winemaking. The soil was so fertile for grape production that they were very wealthy and made the bulk of their money of growing, producing, manufacturing, and selling wine to the empire. That's the city of Philadelphia. And the Jews were not exempt from the obvious opportunity that Philadelphia offered. It's ever so likely that while Paul is at Ephesus, and we know Paul spent quite a number of years at Ephesus preaching, uh, debating, evangelizing, and building up the the church, that he is sending disciples and missionaries and other apostles out to these smaller cities and smaller regions to go and plant churches. And it's ever so likely that Philadelphia is one of these churches that either Paul himself pioneered or one of his own followers planted. And so we have now, we have a basic understanding of the, the life in the city at Philadelphia. And Jesus is going to write a letter to them. And this is how he opens up his epistle. To the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, The words of the Holy One, the true one, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one will open. What an incredible way to open up an epistle. Jesus is holy. Jesus is the one who self-proclaims, who, who makes this self-identification that he is the God who is altogether holy other in holiness. We, we think of holiness as Christians, and we're not wrong to think like this as a, as a moral standard, as a, as a standard of ethic and, 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 and upright behavior and even righteousness. And God is every bit all of that, but infinitely more. Holiness is not that which is a ruler or, or a criteria that we go ahead and we apply to people, things, churches, and God, but God is intrinsically holy. God at the most deepest level, God at essence is a holy God. God is the standard. He dictates what holiness is. It's his moral character and his moral compass by which we know what uprightness and morality and righteousness is at all. God is holy and this is Christ taking this grand appellation this divine appellation for himself. As God is holy, Christ says, so am I. I am fully God. So Jesus writes to the church in Philadelphia, and one thing we notice when we read the letter is there's, there's no rebuke. So many of these other letters come with a, a challenge and, and a rebuke because in some way, shape, or form, they're struggling, they're crumbling, they're being attacked from outside, or there's heresy within, or we saw last week, there's apathy, which is generally sweeping through the members of the church. Philadelphia is one of these churches where there's no rebuke. They are a holy church. They are a church that's actually doing quite well insofar as the law of God commands that we live lives of holiness, that we live lives of service and generosity to our neighbor, to our brothers, to our friends, and even to our enemies as Jesus Christ instructs us. And yet Jesus opens up his letter by saying, as holy as you might be, your holiness is a humane holiness. It's an anthro anthropic holiness. It's a man holiness. But Jesus identifies himself as that which is divine 
holiness. He is all together God. He is all together holy. In every possible way, Jesus is above all, in all, through all, impeccable, impeachable, without any slightest skerrick of sin. This is our Savior. This is our Savior, and this matters in a very big way. The Lord is righteous. He is holy. He is sin-free. And it doesn't take an Einstein to take a moment to think and realize that you and I, we're not. We're not that. We're not sin-free. We're not impeccable. We are not absolutely as sin-free as we might presume. And if anyone here wants to put their hand and say, well, I... I don't sin, I haven't sinned. I would ask you simply to let us shine the the video camera on your life 24 hours a day, seven days a week, all your thoughts, intentions, attitudes, and actions to be beamed live to all the world and let's see if anyone else can find a sin in your life. I suspect that all of us have sinned. I think the Bible gives me license to say that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So holiness for Jesus doesn't just stipulate and exaggerate his moral uprightness and his moral impeachability, but more than that, holiness in scripture speaks to sanctity. It speaks to sanctity, which at the root of that word means otherness. Altogether otherness. Christ is holy because God is holy altogether other than you and I, finite, mortal creatures who are by nature rebellious against God and His rule. By nature, we find sin easy to commit in our life from birth. We are sinners, and so the Scripture says, the heart is deceitfully wicked above all else. Who can comprehend it? We are people who are born in sin, live in sin, and find the most natural thing in our life to do is sin. You want to... On a super exciting, optimistic way to start a sermon, right? But this is the truth. This is what Scripture clearly illumines about our life. And without the Scripture, how few of us really know the depth of our sin. And yet, this is the world that we live in. And Jesus, the Lord, altogether other, altogether sanctified, altogether sanctioned as the glorious Lord of all He is distinct from all that is in this world. And yet down he came to this world to live among us, to take our sin upon himself on the cross and to die for us that we might be forgiven. Jesus himself says that salvation, salvation is not that which comes to the righteous. No one gets gets a high score in the kingdom of God for touting one's own righteousness. Jesus himself used the metaphor and said that it is not the well and healthy who seek out the doctor for medicine and help, but it's the sick. It's the sick who need the physician. And so Jesus speaks to us and says, it is the sinner who he has come to save. I have come to seek and save that which was lost. You're a candidate this morning for salvation if you have been made aware by the Spirit by Scripture, that you are a sinner. Bad news becomes good news in the gospel of Jesus Christ. He's holy. The second identification that he offers in this letter is he says, I am the holy one. And then secondly, he says, I am the true one. I am that which is the embodiment of truth. And we know Scripture says this so often and so regularly. It proclaims the truthfulness of God particularly in Jesus Christ. God cannot lie. There is no shadow in Him. There is no deception and no deformity of lying and untruth in God. Everything God is, is truth. Everything God says is truth. Everything God does is truth. We could worship no other God. We could trust no other God. What kind of a God would it be who would claim to bring hope and say, you know what, sinner, I've come to save you. I I've come to help you. I've come to die for your sins only to realize in a thousand years from now when we are in the glorious city of eternal life for God to turn around and say, hey guys, totally kidding about that whole thing. The whole thing was just some mean, deceitful joke. That was entirely just a, just, just a practical joke on you guys. I am actually going to judge you all according to your sin. We have an unchangeable God. 
We have an immutable God. We have a God who is at essence holy and truth, and we would worship nothing short of that. We aren't very truthful, are we? In so much as we're not very holy, we saw that a moment ago, we're not very truthful either. We're not very honest. We don't often tell people exactly what we're thinking and feeling, and we don't often go out of our way to communicate the reality of the thoughts and the intents of our heart. We are people that stand guarded all the time. We are people that, 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 that never disclose truly what, what's really happening in, inside of our life. We, we often tell people things in words that, that are deceitful and, and misleading, and we, we do this intentionally because we are untrue creatures. This is what we are. Again, it's not pleasant, it's not overly positive, but let me speak a word of truth this morning to you. We are by nature deceitful, but God is all together other. The scripture says he cannot deny himself. He is faithful, he is true, he cannot lie. It's not saying that God doesn't want to lie. That's not what scripture says. Of course, he doesn't want to lie, but that's not what scripture says. Scripture is stronger than that. The revelation of God in the text of scripture says he cannot lie. He's incapable of of lying. What would it mean, we speculate, we, we presume to know, what would it mean to be a being that is omnipotent, omniscient, all-glorious, and speaks words of truth so much so that when you speak it, reality comes to exist? We shared this thought this week at one of our midweek studies. I was talking and I was explaining how powerful God's word of command is. God's words of command are so intrinsically powerful and true and compelling that even things that don't exist yet obey Him. That's how amazingly powerful God's word is. He says light, and such a thing that doesn't exist goes, well, that's me, I'm in, I'm up, that's me. He's commanding me to do something. I don't exist yet, I've just been commanded to do something. It obeys. For everything in creation except you and I, except humans, rebellious human beings who know the Word of God, know the command of God, know the truth value of Scripture, understand the innate essential truthfulness of God, and yet His Word and commands are not enough for us. We disobey, we sin. We can't go to these two self-identifications of Christ in Revelation 3, I am holy, I am true, without genuine perspective on you and I. That is an unsafe, unhealthy thing to do. Jesus is holy. Jesus is altogether true. And the reality is, if you can swallow this hard pill this morning, we are not. We are altogether other than that. We're sinners. We rebel. We disobey. We distrust God. We don't really, truly, intrinsically trust God. We are people who tend to speculate that maybe God's not being honest. God says He will provide all of our needs, and yet we still worry. God says He will take care of us, and that we should take no thought for what we shall eat, or drink, or shelter, or what we're clothed in. And Jesus even points to things in nature. Take a look at lilies, take a look at the birds of the air, and yet we still lose sleep over whether we have a job in the morning. God, God says in His Word that He will provide, He will save, He will be with us, He will carry us, He will convict us of sin and bring righteousness to our lives. And yet how many live in unbelief and refuse to trust in Christ for salvation? That is the greatest blight of humanity today that God has sent His only Son to die on the cross for sinners everywhere to believe. And yet how many refuse Him? The overwhelming testimony of a dying, broken world is he's not holy, he's not true. And so we see that this now mandates us. We have come to believe, we have come to be convinced that Christ is not only holy, but he's our holiness. And Christ is not only true, but he is our truth. He is to us everything that we lean on, that we rely on, that we hold fast to and find in him eternal life. Jesus goes on and actually begins to speak about how he has the, the keys of David. He, he uses an interesting phrase. Let's pull it up here. 
He says, the, the Holy One, the words of the Holy One, the words of the True One, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one opens. This is very interesting here, and we need to just read on real quick so I can build all of this in context. Verse 8, I know your works. Behold, I've set before you an open door. Remember, he's the one with the keys. He opens, no one shuts. He shuts, no one opens. He says to the Christians at Philadelphia, and in turn, all Christians everywhere, I've set before you an open door, which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Behold, I will make them come down and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you. It's interesting, this imagery initially that speaks of the keys of David, where which he can open and no one can shut, and shut which no one can open, actually comes from an illusion, uh, a, a description early in Isaiah 22. There's something spoken here, I should read this for you. Isaiah 22 verse 20, in that day I will call my servant Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, and I will clothe him with your robe and bind your sash on him and will commit your authority to his hand. This is the speaking to the king. And he shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and the house of Judah. And I will place on his shoulder the key of the house of David. He shall open and none shall shut. He shall shut and none shall open. So what's, what's going on here? What, what even is this referring to? What's all this about? Shutting, opening doors, keys, what's, what's this all going on about? Let me build some, some clarity and some context that we've, we've definitely done this before, but it certainly pays to remind and reiterate. The, the, the Jewish synagogues and the Christian churches in the varying cities around the Roman Empire for a long time met and agreed in basic harmony. So we know that for the, several first, for the first several decades of the Christian church, the lion's share of converts were not Gentiles, Greeks, Roman, Barbarian, Scythian, whatever the case may be. The, the lion's share of converts were Jews. They were Jewish people who came to believe that Christ is the promised Jewish Messiah, and He is, and He's come to provide a way to sit on the throne of David and to provide a means of salvation and justification before a holy God. Thousands of Jews embraced Christ as their Messiah at the preaching of the apostles. And so these, these Jews who had become Christians, and, and we might speak anachronistic this morning, call them Messianic Jews, although that, time, that term was never used in that day and age. But, but, but what they would do was they would go to synagogue on Saturday. It's what you do as a good, honorable Jew. You go to synagogue and you worship with the Jews and you hear the Torah expounded and you engage in the worship of the family of Israel. And then on Sunday, they had their own meeting, specific meeting where people who would call upon God in Christ's name would worship, love and adore Him. And this happened in many of the cities in and around, we see the Roman Empire, particularly in Jerusalem. And in Jerusalem is the temple. Every synagogue is to be some kind of microorganism that represents the, the grand scale of the temple in Jerusalem. But something, something world-changing happened in Jerusalem oh, around AD 70. And for you who know your history, you know that Jerusalem itself was wiped off the planet by the Roman army, marching, sacking, burning, destroying temple and city entirely. The Jews in all the Roman Empire who had moved away and dispersed to the major cities of the empire were disgusted and outraged at the Roman treatment of the Jews in Jerusalem. But you know what they were equally outraged at? They were outraged, of course, at the Roman armies coming down to destroy and, and crush the Jewish city, the holy city, the city of David. They were even more outraged that the Christian Jews, the Jews who converted to Christianity, they were outraged that the Christians weren't outraged. The Christians didn't really care. So much so that when the Christians were asked, what do you think of the destruction of the temple? They said, this is the temple of the Holy Spirit. That's not the temple. God's not there. God dwells in us through the Lordship of Christ and the infilling of the Holy Spirit as the gospel of Christ teaches us. And the Jews who welcome these people into their synagogues began to be outraged at this. The Jews didn't lift a finger to defend Jerusalem or to protect the rights of temple worship. 
What was the Jews' reaction to this? We saw this in Smyrna. We're seeing it in Philadelphia. All the synagogues throughout the entire empire, somewhere in the decade of the 80s of the first century, all the synagogues in the entire empire excommunicated every single Christian who named the name of Jesus Christ. They shut the doors against them. Not welcome in Jewish homes, not welcome to Jewish feasts, not welcome to Jewish worship, not welcome in the synagogue. They all together thoroughly and entirely excommunicated them out of their Jewish worship. So we come back to our context now. Jesus says, I have the key of David and I shut and no one opens and I open and no one shuts. And then he continues and he says to them, I know your works. I've set before you an open door. No one's able to shut it. I know that you have a little power. You've kept my word, not denied my name. I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who call themselves Jews but are not. I will make them come down, bow down at your feet, and they will learn I have loved you. They think they have power. They think that that synagogue, that synagogue of Satan, such, such profane, such, such ugly language Jesus intentionally uses to describe the Jewish worship in the city of Philadelphia. It's the same thing we saw that Jesus calls other synagogues in other cities who intentionally set themselves against the Christian church. If you set yourself against the Christian church, you are of Satan. That's the message of Scripture. Whether you are a Jew who practices everything the Torah teaches you, you are of Satan if you stand against the bride of Jesus Christ. And of course, Jesus never, ever takes lightly those who attack his wife. He says to the Christians, be bold, be strong. You, you have a little strength and yet you are, you're down, you're, you're discouraged, you're frustrated because the, the Jews have altogether shut the door against you. But know this, Jesus says, I am the one who holds the keys of David. They aren't the descendants of David. I am, and I am the one who controls doors. And I open a door to the kingdom of life, to the true temple of God. And if you are in me, I will keep the door open for you to enter into life. And more than that, Jesus promises more than that. Your enemies, your enemies, one day they will come. One day they will come. They will collapse before your feet and they will cry out in repentance and begging you in sorrow that they have so offended the bride of Christ. The Jews thought they had won a victory. They thought that what they could do to, to attack the Christians in retaliation would be to expel them from their synagogues and break down the fabric of, of their worship and, and curse them and cuss them out. And even at times we, we saw the, the Jews would dob the Christians into the emperor and have them imprisoned, beaten and killed. And what were the Jews doing the entire time? By pushing the Christians out of the synagogue. They were pushing Jesus himself out. If there's no Christians left, there is no one there to bring you the words of eternal life, the gospel of saving grace, that Jesus is both Lord and Christ. And though he was crucified, God has risen him from the dead for all that believe. He opens, he shuts. Jesus Christ is the one who has the keys of David. And so we see this, this description of the synagogue of Satan Jesus says, I'll make them come and bow down before your feet and they will learn, I have loved you, not them, you. You are the object of the love of God if you are in Christ. Not false religions, not false pretensions, not any religiosity, no matter what form or shape or name it comes under. The religion of Jesus Christ is surrendered to his lordship and faith and trust in his name and his work of death, burial, and resurrection. It goes on and he says, he speaks, he says, because you have kept my word about patient endurance. I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. This is sometimes, this is discussed as a, a great tribulation, a, a worldwide persecution of the Christians so that God would cause them to see who really are of the faith and yet whose faith is in vain. 
It'd be a pretty easy experiment here this morning, wouldn't it? I don't know if you've, I don't know if you've, you've heard the story. I certainly have heard the story myself. There was, a, there was a time, let me share as brief a version as I can. There was a time in Eastern Europe when the communist armies were doing everything they can to rout out the house churches and, and squeeze them out of hiding and imprison and torture and kill them. A, a despicable time, not even that long ago, some decades ago. And there's that story, and, and I can't verify the truthfulness, but I've heard it that many times. It's kind of become legend. I'm sure you've heard it as well. That one day, one Sunday morning, this church that gathered in a, in a pretty small meeting house that they'd built and blocked out the windows, and they'd come one Sunday morning to, to worship, and there they are, and out of nowhere, the windows and the doors burst in, and in comes or it's seemingly an army of men armed, ready to arrest, and they cry out, who among you is a Christian holding their powerful weapons at these believers. What do you do? What do you say? And so as one after the other, the, the small band of believers start to raise their hand and say, I, I'm in Christ, I trust in Jesus. I name the name of Jesus Christ. Once the entire assembly had done that, the, the men with the armor and the weapons pulled off their masks and said, so are we, but we needed to make sure. We needed to make sure this wasn't a, an infidel church, a, a church of spies, because the government had soon begun to plant their own underground churches. As Christians would begin to join them, they would weed them out and arrest them. And so the story goes, a persecution is coming that will weed out false belief and vain belief in the church. The promise of the church in Philadelphia is, I will keep you. I will keep you in that time from the hour of trial. He says in verse 11, I'm coming soon. I'm coming soon. Hold fast what you have so that no one may seize your crown. It's interesting here because as we move on into verse 12 and 13 and, and, and we take a look at the back end of the verse, there's more allusions to this great destruction of Jerusalem and the temple of God built by the Jewish people that was destroyed by the Roman army. And so we see it if we take a look at this together. Jesus' promise to them is this, the one that conquers I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Now, of course, we know that Scripture doesn't give us any, any real idea of a, a temple in, in heaven or a, a temple so much so in the, the new earth, but that the new earth is the temple of God. And those who trust in Christ, those who have given their life to Jesus Christ, are made pillars in that temple. They are given that privilege to be erected and immovable and steadfast in the temple and the worship of God. The promises continue. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven and my own new name. This is, this is so incredible, these promises. The first one starts out by telling these believers that because Christ is coming soon, Hold fast to what you have. Be steadfast. Be immovable. Be rock solid on your confession of Christ. Otherwise, Jesus said, someone will steal your crown. Of course, we've seen this imagery before. This is not a, a crown to, to per se rule an empire or a kingdom, but a, a crown of victory that would be given at the great Roman games. If you won your race, your event, your athletic feat, you were given the crown. And Jesus says that crown can be taken, it can be stolen. You can make shipwreck of your faith if you have believed in vain and if it proves to be that your trust in Christ is temporary. Your trust in Christ is what we call fair weather faith. It doesn't withhold a storm, it doesn't withhold the battering of the tribulation of life. It's the kind of faith that really stands firm when everything is going fine, but when the trials come, we are found lacking. Hold fast, Jesus says. Hold fast so that no one may steal your crown, may seize it from you. To those who conquer. And we've looked at this before. What does it mean to overcome? What does it mean to conquer? It means to hold fast our confession. Then the imagery of the new world begins to come. The temple of God, the abode of the righteous in the new Jerusalem that's descending out of heaven that will take on this new earth and will be the final resting place of all glorious, indescribable joy for every single soul who has trusted in Christ. And in that place, in that new world, in that new glorious abode for the believer, 
We are told we will have written on us the name of God, stamped on us as His possession, as His belonging. We will be seen to belong to our God. The name of the city of God and Christ's own new name will be stamped on us. And then we are told again, as each time we see, he who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Let's pray, shall we ask God to bless our time together around his word this morning. Father, we thank you for your mercy and your grace upon us today. We've, we've looked at this epistle to the Philadelphian church, Father, and we are so encouraged by the fact that they are a, a church that has a little strength left and yet receives no rebuke from you, God. That you've seen their struggles and their challenges with the synagogues of Satan and the, the persecution of the Jews and the Romans and all these external pressures has caused this church to be purified long before the great purification of trial will come to the whole world. So, Father, you've promised them that because they've suffered now, because in Christ they have held fast to the word and been steadfast in their confession, in the trials they have endured now, that you will keep them from the great trial to come. Father, let us not spurn suffering now. Let us not run after it and seek it, but when it comes, let us embrace it, Father, as your gift to us to help our faith grow, to be strengthened and to be remaining steadfast. I pray, Father, this morning in the name of Jesus Christ, you'd help us to be more like the church at Philadelphia, that even though we might be attacked and persecuted and people might despise us and call us cruel things and reject us and so on and so forth, Father, that we would, we would use that to be purified. We would, we would use that to be strengthened and we would know that you are our holiness. You are our truth. And if we remain true to you, we will wear that crown of victory. We will dwell in that new Jerusalem. We will be pillars in that new temple. And we will be stamped with the very name of God. I pray, Father, that all these things would be used to us as incentives to, to grow in our works, to grow in our discipline, to grow in our devotion to you and your kingdom in this world. Father, these things we pray in Jesus' holy name. And all who agreed said, Amen.